Welcome back. Um, yes, the term is due today. Uh, send it in my close of business. If you would, that's defined as 5 o'clock. I will set things up to midnight, maybe even Friday night. Depends on how fanatical I am. But, uh, I want to go over one thing before we... Um, because I'm seeing this coming up along on some midterms. So there are five views of addiction. Addiction is sin, disease, maladaptive behavior, koyaniskatsi, or life out of balance, and addiction is slavery. Those are cultural views. You want to switch it out? Um, I want to check the antenna to make sure it's okay. good and tight. Yeah, yeah, so I think we will have to switch it out. All right. So go ahead and keep going. Okay. So addiction as a weapon is wrong? Addiction as a weapon is, is correct. Basically because slavery in this point of view is seen as a weapon. Okay. And it's under, basically with targeted marketing, okay? It's not simply about what you sell to. So if you remember the question that was on the midterm about targeted marketing of um, menthol cigarettes to minorities. That's a weapon, even though it's about profit. Just like narrow casting um, Marlboros to women, and then, well, we're not selling enough, so let's make it about cowboys. Right? You can't say that marketing to cowboys is racist, but, all right, it has a negative health impact. Right? So it's like a weapon. And weapons take people out. So there are, basically within this, the idea that the people have higher value instead of being equal. Higher value or lower value based on you know, how much they make or whatever. That's an idea that came from slavery. Who, how do you decide which slave is more valuable than another slave? Based on what characteristics? How do you decide one human being is worth more than another? Where is that concept coming from? So there are a number of community organizations that kind of have made that connection between addiction and slavery, and they basically emphasize the connection between economics, addiction, in this particular instance, institutional racism, but then expanding that to other patterns of systemic discrimination, social control, and generally they promote cultural empowerment strategies. Now, within a 12-step framework, that doesn't exist. It could, but it doesn't necessarily. Now, there are some 12-step folks that have made adapt adaptations to that, and I'm going to show you that. So, so we're just going to change Switch that. out the entire unit. Yeah, whole thing. All right. Gives me the screens that says we're experiencing technical difficulties right now. Please stand by. Please stand by. <laughs> See, that's the one you just took off, right? Mm, no. No, that, that was the one I just took off. I just put that down. Okay, hold on. Okay. Yeah. I have been quick straw. Big draw, McGraw. Just old. That was my last name for years. It was McCraw, and they always called me McGraw. Okay, so yeah. that should be working. All right. Control room, is it working? Uh, guess we'll know. All right, so take, for example, this. So this doesn't exist anymore. This is a period piece uh, in the late 90s. Gallagher's is on Martin Luther King Boulevard in Oakland. And this came out of uh, the Oakland Crack Task Force. So this was an open-air crack supermarket at the time. And uh, right now Gallagher's is painted like a dark uh, brown, and this had got painted over. So this is when it was basically a white wall. And it was an open-air crack supermarket. And so two activists went in, and uh, they painted a line of slaves 
with crack pipes in their mouth, because you know, if this is in the heart of the hood in Oakland, you know how black people feel about slavery, right? So, crack, same game, new name, 20th, cocaine is 20th century slavery. Same game, new name, same old color, right? So, line of slaves and chains with crack pipes, right? And so, the dealers came in and saw that in the morning, and they left, and they never came back to that corner. And even, I mean, so the police had done the usual thing of, you know, periodic drug busts and didn't do anything. That got put up, and they never came back to that corner. Now, technically, as a prevention strategy, it's illegal, because it's graffiti. You just deface somebody's business. But that business wasn't doing anything about the crack supermarket, and neither was the cops. So here's a message. And so even the winos that basically go to Gallagher's are going, wow, that's saying something. Yes, it was, right? Have addiction. So have you met your new master? So this meme of addiction is slavery is a fairly cogent one within the black community. Now, not everybody that's black that's in the addictions field subscribes to that. But it's common enough that I said, OK, how would you fight this? Slavery had, was legally supported. Addiction is legally supported. How would you fight it? Well, you basically have to convince the users to give it up, just like you'd free slaves. So it's a continual process of education and activism, right? So it actually started a promotional campaign called Signs of Recovery, in which they basically did a whole billboard campaign around supporting recovery. So what if we did recovery billboards as much as we did liquor and tobacco ads? Hmm. All right. So part of what we're talking about in terms of treatment goals and this is basically coming from um, the first African-American treatment summit in Oregon about, uh, let's see, this is about 07 or 09. And there was a phrase that basically said, if it's not culturally specific, it's dominant culture. Now, where this came from in terms of looking at treatment goals, if you look at the evolution of drug treatment, which somewhere around 90% of the treatment agencies are 12-step oriented, and 12-steppers don't necessarily go in for cultural frameworks. They couldn't actually even see the need. You know, the story that I told you about Bill W. bringing the two black guys into midtown Manhattan, right, they didn't get why black guys would need AA. Okay, sure, that's the 40s or 50s. But just like that, they didn't get the idea of why women would need a separate treatment facility <coughs> that their kids could be at so that we take care of the kids and the kids go to school and they're in a safe environment, abuse-free. And that maybe we don't necessarily want men in group with them because of that whole dynamic. We might engage them later, but... <coughs> For a period of time to build sobriety, they should be in a safe cultural environment, and that is staffed by other women in recovery. That took a long time to catch on, and there was resistance within that, to that. But now it's a fact. We do that now, right? So that's a culturally specific treatment. The word is milieu from the French, right? But it means an environment. I can spell it out if you want. A spell check doesn't give you that. <coughs> milieu means, uh, or milieu, if you're more American anglicized, it means an environment, an atmosphere. So if it's not culturally specific, it's dominant culture. And one of the challenges that we found in terms of the research is that acculturation that is 
where you're basically taking on the cultural artifacts from another culture and incorporating them into your own without erasing your own is better for you than assimilation, which is where you erase your cultural protective factors and assimilate into a dominant culture. Okay, so what we found, especially with studying ethnicity, is that foreigners coming to America are at risk for substance abuse because in their home country, they didn't abuse as much, and when they come here, Americans are abusing more than anyone else. It's, and, but what we found then, as long as they hold to whatever their cultural values were, here in America, their substance use stays low. And it's only as they begin to assimilate into the culture that their use goes up. All right, so for example, <coughs> remember when I said 80% of the illegal drug users were rich white men. This is in the just say no days of Reagan. Okay? White males who made upwards of 50K. And that's from the household survey. And then at that same time, 13% white females. And then 7%, so if you break it down like that, so 93% in the 1980s, 93% of the illegal drug users in the United States are white people. But they're not going to jail. Who's going to jail? Well, the 7%. 3% of those are African American. And the other breakdown is, you know, it, so if, we, if we're tracking, like, kids in school, because you have to specify when they're studying this, right? So who's using drugs in school? White kids. Then Native American kids in two drug categories, that is alcohol, and inhalants. Then Hispanics. Then black. Then Asian. So this is kids in school. Okay, tracked by Monitoring the Future, which basically surveys every year since the early 80s. And this trend is held consistent. But when, if you look on television, who's the drug user? Black kids or black people. But even though it's been a consistent trend that the actual drug users are not black people. So you have a disconnect between what the science is saying and what TV is saying, and guess who, whose attitudes shape the lawmaking? Not the science. Yeah. And also the treatment. Not the science. Okay? So this is kids in school. So here's another little factoid. If these kids of color... So notice that Asians are, have the lowest drug use rates attract in school, of anybody in school. The longer the, my ethnic minorities remain in the school system, their use still remains below white kids, but it starts going up. Still remaining below white kids, adjusting for population, but the longer they stay in school, the more their use goes up. And so we attribute that to assimilation. Okay, who are the popular kids in your school? And what is defined as popular? 
I mean, you can see it in the media. Who are the popular kids? And what's their demographic and what do they do? So if you want to be down with the popular kids, what are you going to do? Huh. So if we have cultural clubs, if we have cultural protective factors that say, OK, we need you to finish college. And drugs, you don't need drugs to finish college for your people or whatever, then that becomes a protective factor. Now, the question then becomes, what is a protective factor for white kids? Hmm. I mean, I can answer that. It's not even rhetorical to me. But that's not necessarily a question that I can impose on the Euro-American community. You know, because we've, we've run a rites of passage program here at Lane for like 20 years in response to what was happening in the juvenile justice system. They were basically not treating any kids of color with substance abuse because the kids of color were going to largely white schools where the white kids were going to the sharp unit and, you know, going to treatment, but the black kids, all the ki not just the black kids, kids of color were not getting treated by Serbu. Therefore, they were getting deeper and deeper into the criminal justice system with untreated substance abuse. And we already know what happens with untreated substance abuse. They can continue to commit crimes until you give them treatment. And if they're not getting treatment, well, why is that? Why are you denying medical care to a particular set of signs and symptoms? So we started developing culturally specific treatment. And here at Lane, what that turned out to be was rites of passage. So in 20 years, we've had 600 black kids go through our rites of passage program, and three of them have gone to jail. Three out of 600. Okay, so you ask Serbu, well, what's your record? They won't tell you, because they can't. All right, so, and so people have asked us, well, why don't you start a gay and lesbian right, youth rites of passage? Why don't you start a white rites of passage? Fine, great. Here's what you need to do to interface with the rest of us. Okay, you need a non-homophobic, non-sexist, non-racist, non-classist vision of what white culture is and teach kids that, just like we did in our programs. We teach people to get along and teach people about systemic discrimination, particularly in the black side, because that's what we're about. Y'all need to figure that out, too. What does that look like for you? We can't tell you what that is. We can't. You need to discover what that is for yourself. Do the work that we did, right? Otherwise, so the following slides then, so dominant culture is basically toxic for everybody. Let's recreate it. <laughs> what does that look like? All right. So if it's dominant culture, you had to erase an indigenous life way to assimilate into an addictive cultural norm in which lying to yourself and others becomes normal and addictive behaviors are substituted for healthy, non-addictive norms. So this is coming out of what the research was saying from what I told you the other day. Maladaptive behavior. Okay, so in case you didn't get this one on the midterm, it's not that you failed to learn healthy behaviors. The culture doesn't teach them to begin with other than saying, don't do that, don't do this. Well, it doesn't tell you what to do. So it's not that you improperly learned healthy behaviors. No, you were never taught the healthy behaviors to begin with, other than brushing your teeth and flossing every meal. Three minutes, said the dentist this morning. You should be, you know, three minutes at least, and flossing after every meal. Right, we don't do that. All right? So, erase an indigenous life way. When I mean life way as opposed to lifestyle, a lifestyle is something you take on because 
it seems like a good idea. A life way is how your people live across the lifespan. It's your culture. Okay, to assimilate. So assimilate simply means to erase. And in order to become American, we had to erase an indigenous life way. Indigenous means where your folks were living for longer than a hundred. When, when your folks, wherever your people were from, where they lived there for a hundred generations. Wherever you're from. Well, I'm Irish. You know, okay, so if you're... Irish or Scottish or German, right. Your people live there for a hundred generations, 2,000 years. You were indigenous there. Okay, everybody in America, except for those of us who've had ancestors that were native, have only been here for 200 years, 10 generations. Yeah, America is the only thing you know, but there's no indigenous lifeway here. Mostly because it got erased. And you had to give up your ethnic identity if that's part of your indigenous lifeway to become American. But what does American mean? What are the rites of passage for being an American? Right, you frown. Yeah, what is it? A uh, driver's license? First time you drink, first time you use, first time you have sex, turning 18, 21, you can legally drink. What are the rites of passage here? What are the rituals that tell you who you are and how you're going to live your life? Where do you learn that from? If you have difficulty answering that question, it's because it's ne either never been posed to you or there's a serious cultural deficit that, that you ain't been told that. So if you haven't been told that internal to your family of origin, then the corporations are going to step in and basically say, you are your buying choices. You are your Facebook profile. You do understand that Facebook is a corporation using you to sell stuff. Using you as the product to sell more stuff. Okay, that, that's what it is, right? So, an addictive cultural norm in which lying to yourself and others becomes normal and addictive behaviors are substituted for healthy non-addictive norms. So... In other words, a culture that pushes pills, not skills. Pills are easy to do. Skills are harder to learn and practice. So pills are not skills. Okay, and that's basically what happens within dominant culture. We push pills, not skills. The skills exist. The skills are what an indigenous life way was built on. We taught you how to do this before there were drugs to do it for you. So this came out of that lecture uh, some, from some friends of mine who uh, were running a program, a women's program, and they were black women. They had some white women too, but they're basically saying, okay, we're noticing black people are failing in treatment. Black women in particular are failing in even women's treatment. Well, why is that? Well, that's because they need to deal with certain issues that are defined within the science. If the 12 steppers think are uncomfortable dealing with racism or homophobia, you are, you are defocusing from your treatment goals. No, this is, this is why this is coming under treatment goals. 
This is a treatment goal, to be able to focus on a per person's primary wounding. So, Franz Fanon, this is from one of his books, Black Skin, White Masks. He was a black psychiatrist who basically um, said there are th several things that Western civilization does to you. First, alienation from yourself, alienation from the significant other. That is, for example, your partner. So if we apply this to women's treatment, so alienation from her optimal self, alienation from her, uh, if it's heterosexual, or her husband or boyfriend or partner, alienation from the general other, that means the larger society, alienation from one's culture of origin, and alienation from creative social activities. So if drugs have become the substitute for any or all of those, then you need to teach people, you need to create a new identity that's healthier. That might not be socially defined. But first you would need to connect with yourself, then your culture of origin, then engage in creative social activities and engage with the other folks if you were going to basically, for example, pick an order of how you would do this. Connect alienation, the opposite of alienation would be connection. And common stress responses to racism from the literature. So anger, paranoia, anxiety, helplessness, hopelessness, frustration, resentment, fear. Think black women only feel that in treatment? No. <laughs> so. If you were basically going to say, if you had been subject to other systems of pattern discrimination, like classism, like sexism, you would feel those things too. Should treatment legitimately focus on those issues? Mm -hmm. Oh, hell to the yeah. Mm -hmm. But these black women... 12 steppers took it upon themselves to do the research in the black scientific literature, that is, the scientific literature written by African Americans. It's publishable, it's searchable. If you know where to look, if you know the names, it is published. I said, okay, how do we create a treatment program that not only serves black women, but also the white women that we get with us? Because white women have these issues too. Just not necessarily with race, but they might. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, key Adele developmental tasks and issues for African Americans. So, I'm basically showing you this not only because you might encounter, if you're a pro, going to be a pro and work in the field, that you might encounter the odd African American in treatment, but so that you can adapt these wherever you go to whoever you're facing. <clears throat> so, refining a healthy identity that transforms social messages of inferiority, pathology, and deviance based on color, race, and or culture. Strengthening skills for negotiating bicultural and multiracial environments. So, for example, community college is a bicultural environment, independent of race. If you are the first person in your family to go to college, if you weren't raised by college-educated folks, this is a bicultural experience for you. You know, when previous classes have said to me, speak English, what? I said acetylcholinesterase. That is English. <laughs> Okay, science English, technical English. Milieu is French, but it become an English word just like deja vu did, for the same reasons. Two, strengthening skills for negotiation, uh, I did that. Engaging the struggle against social injustice, that is a treatment goal. 
managing and informing experiences of social injustice and societal inconsistencies based on race or color, because this is coming out of a black psychologist database, and developing and implementing parenting skills for instructing children on how to survive and negotiate the bicultural, sometimes hostile environment. All right, so what I was saying to you the other day about the resilient child and saying that you only needed one do domain, family, school, or community to produce a resilient child, ideally you should have all three, but sometimes you only get one. So in my family it was about, okay, the world's gonna be hostile to you. It's not just the dude dropping a cigarette in your hoodie at Disneyland, <laughs> okay? And it's not all white people either. So you're gonna, you need to know who's your friend, who's not, and you need to be determining that in the first 30 seconds. No pressure. But teaching that to your youth. So this is an important one, I think. <clears throat> so even though it came out of what, you know, what Jackie said and Olivia said, because <clears throat> they're the ones that are delivering the workshop. <clears throat> so n racial and or personal trauma must be dealt with as part of the treatment experience because it becomes a driver of addiction where you're self-medicating it. So it's not what's wrong with me but what happened to me? So in case this shows up on a final near you, you'll be expected to complete, it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? I didn't bring my copy of DSM-5, but basically when you look at DSM-5, It's a collection of all addictions and all mental illnesses which describe very well what those things are, but it doesn't describe the way out or what you should do if you're bipolar or if you have oppositional disorder. Well, I have oppositional disorder. I have problems with authority. I won't do the opposite of what authority tells me. That's a disorder. That's one of the descriptors of it. Well, what if you've never encountered respectable authority? Should you trust them? Uh, no. Right? I have congenital drapetomania aegypticus. Did I explain what that is? The founder, one of the founders of the American Psychological Association was a Southern physician in, in the Civil War days who basically said that slaves escaping slavery were mentally ill because they were escaping slavery. And he coined two mental illness, Drapetomania aegypticus is one of them. So I'm the descendants of slaves that taught ourselves how to read when it was a death sentence so we could formulate a way to escape. So under his lights, we crazy. Because we want to escape slavery. He's crazy. Uh, from our point of view, only because we won. <laughs> right? So this is one of the people that founded, eventually founded the American Psychological Association, which to this day, in DSM-5, does not recognize that racism has any emotional or psychological impact on you whatsoever. Does not exist. So if that sounds crazy, understand, oh, well, this is where they came from. So if that's where they... I'm crazy for escaping slavery, then no wonder they're not going to recognize racism. So that's why we have to come up with our own model to deal with it. How do they justify that? Right. Hmm. Well, here's how they justify, because my father and his homies are, you know, black psychiatrists, and they go, 
And they've been trying to work for 40 years with APA to like, classify races. Look, you did this for the gays, all right? Gender identity dysphoria, all right? You don't feel good about your gender identity, so you know, we can charge insurance, and Prozac ain't going to help that, but we might be able to do some reframing therapy and talk therapy and work it through it, because it's not a mental illness or disease. It's an orientation, human diversity. That's the way we think. That's the science, right? We could do that with race. Ethnic identity dysphoria, we could do that, sure. But they would say, oh, well, we don't want to pathologize racism because their argument is racism is so widespread, we'd have to say that society is crazy <laughs> if racism is a mental illness, like some of us say, because it looks like schizophrenia. Denial, projection, justification, blaming, delusions of superiority, paranoia. Oh, you, I'm, I'm deaf, partially deaf. My window is rolled up and your music's too loud. I'm threatened, blam, 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 blam. Oh, for, forget that he had a silencer in the car. That's illegal. Forget that he had four abusive relationships. So we don't convict him of killing a kid. We convict him of attempting to kill the other kids in the car. What? That's what happened. Uh-huh. So he's not crazy? <laughs> but, okay. <clears throat> so APA has a point. We'd have to, well, we don't want to pathologize society. We don't want to, you know, pathologize racism because it's so widespread. We'd have to determine that society's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and? Yeah. Well, but, yeah, well, do you think the American Psychological Association is going to cop to that? They're not. So what they're going to do and yeah, and then the next question is, well, then what is the therapy? And we're, we would say, look, Prozac ain't going to cure racism. Okay, we're not even saying that. But there might be some, some talk therapy, some reframing, some other things that you could do. Well, we're doing that already. So we don't need your blessing. You know, yeah, I'm a drapetomaniac. What that means is I'm obsessed with freedom. Way obsessed with it. Like, if you try and mess with me, you try and curtail my freedom, I will fight you. Usually verbally. Don't mess with my freedom. And I'm not talking about my Second Amendment rights. I'm talking about the most dangerous weapon. I think some of them need Prozac. Hey, well. KKK and all those people, you know, it's crazy but, stuff. But, yeah, so... What happened to them, what happened to racists, you know, and you know, one of my uh, colleagues that trained here and, you know, is basically working because we're paid, like I'm paid, to deal with racist skinheads where I'm the first black person they've ever had a conversation with. And it's about, uh, look, your skinhead homies gang raped you and left you under a porch in Whitaker. So here you are with the shakes. I'm going to like get you into Buckley House, but in 40 days, I'm sorry to tell you this, but in 40 days, you're going to have to come back in student health and get an AIDS test. Because this was your jailhouse skinhead homies that gang raped you over 540s. Sorry it's the black guy that has to tell you this, but I want you to hear this and not be freaked out because of my excellent suntan. Ha, ha, ha. I'm part of the medical community, as you are training to be, too. We can't deny treatment based on somebody's political beliefs. They're a patient. So that's my standard. And they can respect that. <clears throat> and so, right, so he had trouble with black people because a black guy raped his sister. Okay, that ain't me. I ain't never been to jail. Okay, I was arrested once when I was 17. That don't count. 
for weed, duh. <laughs> yeah, I inhaled. I'm a drug counselor. Stay away from the brown acid. That's from Woodstock, if you're not old enough to remember that. That was an announcement from the stage. Okay? <laughs> the 60s, yeah. Anyway, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. That trauma is often the generator for a host of problems. So what happened to you? What was the wound? <clears throat> How were you abused? Are you still being abused? How do you create your safety? How do you heal it? Yeah, what are the emotions? Anger, shame, guilt, fear? Here's one thing I understand about the Ku Klux Klan. Assuming what the granddaughter of an IRA martyr told me, Ku Klux Klan started out of Clan McGregor in Scotland. They were tortured, lynched, their women raped, their men killed, the women and children sold into slavery in America by the Christian English. So everything that the Ku Klux Klan did to black people was done to them in England by white people. Everything. So that's why when they lynch people, they bury them in water because the water washes the blood away and the burning cross thing and all that other kind of stuff. What was once done to them, they did to us. So it's easy for people to understand abusers abuse people sometimes. Not all of them, but it happens. But you can't necessarily tell. I'm not the one necessarily to tell them that. But I got that from a white person whose study of history is part of her cultural recovery. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, white people need to do their cultural work, like we did, and recover a healthy, non-addictive culture. Because you ain't getting that in America, Joe Sixpack, who's actually drinking a case. So what does that look like? Can't be blaming us. Yeah, the black guy raped your sister. Well, yeah, sorry about that, but that's not all of us. And what about the, all the slave, black women that got raped as slaves? Uh, I'm not blaming you for that. I'm just saying, people have trauma. Look at the motions. <clears throat> Fear, for example, or anxiety. Attack with the thing, attack the thing that you fear immediately. So like the rules are Jedi combat. If you've watched Star Wars, when you're outnumbered, what do you do? Attack the biggest dude first. Take them out, the rest of them scatter. If you get wiped out, well, it's a good day to die, right? But that doesn't happen in the, mo in the Jedi movies, right? So attack your biggest fear immediately, and then the smaller ones will run. So anger. Feel the pain. Heal the hurt, uh, hurt appropriately. Is it an emotional cut, emotional burn, a scrape, a break, contusion, a betrayal? Have you, have you been bruised? Okay. What do you do for self-soothing? One of my teachers, Alice Coltrane, once said that anger burns, meditation heals, meditation cools. Have to learn forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting go of your attachment to the anger. Yeah, it hurt. Yeah, they hurt you but stop focusing your anger on them and focus on healing yourself. So what do you do for self-soothing? 
And also, is there a community of suffering? And what I mean by that, this is from Howard Thurman, who was Martin Luther King's teacher. He basically said, there's a community of people who have gone through what you've gone through that can help you with this. That's why 12-step programs work, because there's a global community of folks. Now all they have to do is add a little neuroscience, a little psychology, they be straight. A little political analysis, get people jobs, they be straight. But I'm a normie, I can't tell them what to do. So we saw that already. Okay. What does this look like? Offense. Huh? Offense. Offense. Okay. I'm meshing. Meshing. With guitar strings. Could be vibrating guitar strings. Good. It could be a mattress. <laughs> here's, here's why I'm using this particular graphic, okay? There are multiple threads and cycles. You go up and you go down, all right? So the whole idea, the conceptual idea behind bipolar, what we used to call manic depressive, these are what are referred to as sine waves. So yes, you pluck a guitar string, it makes a sine wave, right? So let's say this line is normal. <laughs> uh -huh. Whatever normal is, right? And in manic depressive or bipolar, you feel really good, you feel really bad. You feel really good, you feel really bad. You feel really good, you feel really, you know, you're cycling. And it's a cycle, right? So when you have multiple <coughs> cycles going on, it looks like that. Good days, bad days, that time of the month. Guys have that time of the month, but not with bleeding. They do. They're on a cycle too. We're all making estrogen and testosterone, and they go in cycles. Uh, look, I'm not making this up. It's the science. It's just not obvious. Some days we're more, more of a dick than others. <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm flying. <laughs> I'm just getting real here, right? Or some days right, okay. So here's what we're trying to do with clients, and I hope I really compose this correctly. The idea is this. <clears throat> Through all the cycles, there's a common thread, a core, an original healthy self. Okay, that's what we'll call normal. And sometimes you're above normal, and sometimes you're below it. And so the object is to try and stay as close to the line as possible. Okay, so the idea within treatment and a treatment goal should be able to help the client find that optimal line and expand it. And I think I had a graphic that has a cool version of this. So remember, it's not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. The suffering must be contextualized to be healed. What I mean by contextualized, you need to be able to tell them a story or help them find a story that fits their suffering within an overall pattern of healing. You went through this for a reason. And often the reason is, from an expanded point of view, so you could walk somebody else through this problem. And there's a message in terms of the community of suffering. 
there are other people that have gone through this. You can connect with them. And they can teach you. And you can be a teacher of other people, too. Okay? So if the suffering is from systemic neglect, you can't trust the system to bring you healing. You have to create your own healing and create a therapeutic community of like-minded people. Okay, this came straight out of the black literature, but obviously this ain't, this ain't just applicable to black people. You know, we're often thought, oh, it's always about the race card with you guys. Uh, race in the card, we're not playing poker. <laughs> you attempted to burn us, so we're paranoid. And just because we're paranoid does not mean you're not after us. So some of us are going to be obsessed with freedom. We are. And we're going to look for any game that you've played before and be suspicious. Okay, if the suffering is from systemic neglect, then people can't trust the system. And that's why people who have oppositional disorder, well, you have problems with authority? Uh, yeah, because authority has screwed you over. Should you trust them if you've been screwed over? Uh, on what basis? Authority has to be trustworthy. All right, so how have people done this? So... <clears throat> Again, for a cult certain cultural groups, being born in America or coming to America increases addis addiction risk. Practicing cultural protective factors greatly reduces certain problems. Some of these pro factors uh, can be adapted outside of their originating culture. So what I, what I used to call culturally validated best practices or the the other scientific term, or the scientific term, community-defined evidence. So remember what I said the other day about empirical data, where they call best practices, where it's been scientifically validated. Well, if the system doesn't acknowledge that racism exists, they're not going to fund research on how you heal from racism. Or sexism. They're not going to do it. But there are cultures that have been attacked along those lines that have developed their own healing. So that's where community defined evidence. Community of suffering that says, okay, this is how we healed from our, self, from our common problem. Let me see if I have a better graphic for bipolar. And then I can move it. Ah, here it is. The best is yet to come. Okay, sine waves. Okay, bipolar. Up, down, right? Let's say that that's normal. Okay? So, it's not that normal is good or bad, but it is, let's say, let's say that it's optimal. So how do we expand that optimal? What's the skill to increase what normal is? Okay, because you have ups or downs. My problem in this environment, personally, yeah, high stress occupation. And usually what makes me angry is how other people treat students. Way pisses me off. But I can't express that to them, and I don't necessarily express that to the students, but I hold it in, which raises my blood pressure, and so I gotta med meditate, right? 
exercise. Watch my diet, sugars, blood pressure, blah, 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 right? So normal might be high stress. So if I know that, here's what I need to do. Expand normal. Now, notice that in this particular graphic, I originally designed it because here was normal. You have emotional ups and downs, normally. So the skill would be to expand your normal so you're not thrown off. You're not taken off your center. Let's say that that's your center line. You're not thrown off by your ups or downs. You handle them. You surf them. But here's what usually happens. That would be the skill, being able to handle the ups and downs that are normal. right? But here's what happens. They give you a pill. Right? So the things they give you for bipolar or mood stabilizers, right? So you have a drug to cover it up, <laughs> your swings, or to stabilize your swings, chemically. That's how they work, through the neurotransmitter system. And so what we want to do skill-wise is expand that beyond, so I can't you know, ethically argue you out of your drug, but I can give you a skill set that you can practice while you're on the drug that will supersede the drug so that the highs and the lows become encompassed as part of your normal and it doesn't throw you off. That's a skill set. That's what your genome was designed to do before we had pharmaceuticals basically only for less than a century. We were evolved to do that, and some people incorporated those skills and techniques within their culture and didn't rely on pills. Okay, so that you can become more responsive and less reactive. All right, I'm going off into deep water now, just warning you, okay? So, what is, used to be called the Egyptian Mystery School, and this is the reason I'm going into this, just so you know, is if you're going to design a treatment program from the ground up, even if you're the only one that's part of it. So even if you don't get paid and you're on another job or you're on a job that isn't even involved with treatment, but you're encountering that crazy relative or that person who's been experiencing that crazy relative, what do you do? All right? So the culture that generated Part of what a healthy African-American psyche was, this is what I'm going to show you. I'm just saying, what would your healthy culture look like if it's not America? So you might have to go back and figure out what that was, if the information was available. Well, for African-Americans, it was available. So we went looking for it. We didn't learn this in school. We had to go find it. You might have to do that too, right? So I'm just sharing you what we did, right? The Egyptian mystery schools had three grades of students at three stages, initiation, illumination, perfection. The mortal, so the, they were mortal students, intelligent students, and the creators and sons and daughters of light. So they're all students, but they're different stages. The probationary students who were being instructed but who had not yet experienced the inner vision, that is the initiation. Like, who are you? Where do you come from? They're just discovering that. The intelligences, i.e. those who had attained the inner vision and had received mind or noose or consciousness, also known as illumination. Now they can see. I know who I am, I know who I can see, 
And then the creators and sons of daughters of light who had become identified with, that is, you know who you are, or united with, you act as if you are the light. Hence, initiation, illumination, perfection. So people at this stage were referred to within the Egyptian mystery school system as Christ, that is, the anointed one. Perfection. Christ is not just one historical person. It was a stage of initiation in the Egyptian mystery schools. So there are actually multiple Christs, definitely seven historical ones. But beyond that, <coughs> this is a stage that you're being led through in terms of illumination and then perfection. So part of that, Initiation, you see with the inner vision. Illumination, you see the inner vision reflected out in the world. Perfection, the outer world comes to reflect the inner divine world through your active illumined intervention. So it means in terms of addiction, you can't be stuck. You can't be strung out yourself and help others. You have to be unstuck to be able to help them and acting in an unstuck way. Okay, you're perfecting through practice your vocation as you're called to it. Your vocation literally means your voice. That is, your voice, your word becomes manifest as a seer and creator on earth. Your word becomes manifest. So if some of these phrases seem familiar through your Bible, right, that's where they came from. The Egyptian mystery schools which preceded the Christian Bible and the Koran and all that other stuff. Okay, your answer, that is, what you do with your voice. The call compels the answer. That is, oops, yeah, the call compels the answer. You're called to a vocation. So vocation isn't just your work, it's your life work. What you speak happens. Now, what does this have to do with training drug counselors? <laughs> show you. Okay, so mystery schools treat, my, mystery is my story. So it's not a mystery, it's my story. Initiation, you see with the inner vision, the recovered, healthy, realized person inside the suffering addict while they are suffering, and you call it out in them. They may be going through DTs. They may be, you know, crashing and coming down off a of meth. They may be tweaking. So you look past that to see the healthy, recovered person that's inside the suffering addict. And you speak the recovered, healthy addict into being. But in order to be able to do that, you have to be a healthy, recovered addict yourself. You can't give what you don't know. You can't teach what you don't know. You can't lead where you don't go or you haven't been. You have to be there. That's what I'm doing even with the skinhead. Look, I know you're scared of me. I'm trying to help you heal. I know you got hurt. I didn't hurt you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I can see the healthy, recovered, non-racist person inside of you. And I'm calling it out. You will come forth. Like Yeshua would say, come, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> Look, you don't have to be a super being to do this. You just have to be human. Okay, you call it out. You have to see it and be practiced in, okay, this is what you need to do. Well, stop using. You're going to go through this withdrawal process. It's going to be hard. Then, once you're clean and sober, the real battle begins. 
you're going to have to make new friends. Well, the only friends I know are using friends. Oh, right. You're going to have to make new friends. Well, I haven't made a new friend since middle school. You're going to have to learn to make new friends. Yeah, it's scary. Feel the fear. Do it anyway. All right? Illumination. You see the inner vision reflected out in the world. You can show them role models in the world and how to avoid the traps and find recovery in the world. Okay, stay away from shaky persons, places, and things. Get rid of your stash. Get rid of your bongs, your dabs, your whatever. Get rid of your paraphernalia. Call your dealer. Well, better not call your dealer. But <laughs> delete his number. Delete his number. Don't let them call you. Don't let your no become no K. Okay, don't be distracted. Perfection. The outer world comes to reflect the inner divine world through your active illumined intervention. This means, again, you can't be stuck yourself and you teach others to remain free, even when they fall. Because you're holding to that vision of the recovered person. <coughs> Sometimes you have to hold that for them because they're scared. This is hard stuff. It's scary. Let them be safe with you. Yes, you can do it. You're walking the same path that others before you have walked. You can do this. And then I'll ask, have you been an addict? Uh, no. I wasn't allowed to be. And I tell them why. Yeah, I'm a normie in 12-step terms. I've never been addicted to alcohol or other drugs. Even when I was abusing weed, it's like, you know, I'm using the old dsm 4 abusing. I was still a high-performance drug user. Still could make straight A's. Not everybody can do that. Do you have, um, do you have addiction in your genetics? Um... No, but there's a class piece within my framework. So, you know, I'm the son of a doctor and dad has a mini wine cellar. So they might drink, you know, wine with a meal. Not drinking alone, not drinking, not being constantly sloshed. So, you know, I have a drug tolerance. I have seen other of my relatives be alcoholics. So I know it's within the family. Just not expressing the way we are in terms of, you know, professional. We, we were never allowed, I was never allowed to not perform in school. Not miss a day of work. I wasn't allowed to have a drug habit. And my politics didn't allow me to have a drug habit. This is war. That's how I saw it. I didn't expect to live past 30. This is war. The corporations and the government want me strung out as a means of slavery. That's how I saw it. I still see it that way. Why should I let them win? So, no, never did heroin or meth or whatever. Ten lines of coke as part of the L.A. music industry. That's nothing. Before crack hit, they just laugh at me. Twenty acid trips. One ketamine trip. I don't meet the clinical definitions of addiction, but I've held people while they were dope sick. I've sat with tweakers in my office. Oh, there's a sniper up there. Yeah, why are you so important that there's a sniper in the top of the tree in the tree line? Why don't they just walk up to you and pop a cap? Why are you so important? You know, I mean, okay, come back when you're not tweaking. Like, Give yourself three days, get some sleep, then come see me. Right? So you're perfecting through practice your vocation as you're called to it. Your vocation, your voice, your word becomes manifest as a seer and creator, son or daughter of light on earth. Okay? Your answer. What you do with your voice. The call compels the answer.
So basically, you know, if, especially if you were in, you know, the class before where we talked about uh, Angie Arian's fourfold way. Tell the truth without blame or judgment is the way of the visionary. Okay? So I've actually seen this done in treatment. It's actually, it's tricky unless you actually set up the entire treatment center that way, which is why I'm planning this meme. I'm just saying, I do this. I found a body of literature that explains how you do this from a spiritual point of view. This requires being a meditator. This requires knowing a person's history and a person, uh, their people's trauma even when they don't know it. This is why I'm saying, look, I'm a black Indian. I need to know my history and I need to know your history in order to heal you. And I will go find it out. Because you need to be healed and I need to heal you so that the world gets better. So that's why I know so much stuff about that. So I'm just saying, oh, once I found, oh, Egyptian mystery schools, that's why I'm doing this. Okay. That explains a lot. All right. So let's see. Okay. <clears throat> Who knows it feels it. So unconscious, so I guess I shouldn't skip this, right? The difference between mental masters and mental slaves is the master possessed mind, consciousness, or illumination, or awareness of the unconscious, a menta, which is your personal infinite reservoir of knowledge connected to the universe. And the mental slave did not. So that's where Bob Marley's line, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, comes out of Egyptian mystery schools. So here's what that means. Unconscious means the store of knowledge that we all are unaware of, but not that it's unknowable, you're just not aware of it. So from an Af African point of view, which is where this is coming from, the knowledge of the universe, and where the knowledge of the universe is taught, the university, was already in every person from birth. Every human being has the wisdom of the universe inside them already. The purpose of education is to let you know that and bring it out. So that's how I can come from the point of view of, I can see the recovered healthy person inside this suffering addict through spiritual vision. It's a reality. They just haven't caught up to the reality now. I just got to walk them through that. Okay? Purpose of education is draw the knowledge out rather than pour it in. Show them where they have the knowledge already. Fill in the blanks. So... <clears throat> Yes, this was a little editorial that came along with this particular thing. So African people is not just black people, it's everybody on the planet within this particular framework. As long as you do not listen to your own mind or self and continue to look to the oppressor for guidance or models of achievement. And if they wanted to achieve, you achieved, they wouldn't oppress you, which is precisely the point of achieving when they oppress you. In fact, if they're oppressing you, it means you're more powerful than them already. That's why they're oppressing you. Like public enemy says, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back, but we also hold ourselves back. So in the codependency model, yeah, you, um, go ahead. How do you teach someone who believes in science to believe in something like non provable I guess you'd say, like something spiritual, like beyond... Like if you have a client come in and they are very strict on their like scientific beliefs. Okay. You want the way to do that? Uh huh. Is that something <laughs> of interest? Yeah. Okay. So in psych so three I, I found Ken Wilber's three eyes very useful in do doing that. So I'm gonna go down here because I know it's in here to show you. Yep. 
Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Transpersonal psychology. Ken Wilburn. Transpersonal beyond the person. All right. The beyond exists. We can talk about it. We can map it. So in his book, Three Eyes, he talks about the eye of flesh, the eye of mind, and the eye of contemplation. The eye of flesh, which basically is the material, concrete, and sensual world, that is the world of the five senses. The eye of mind, which, from which the symbolic, conceptual, linguistic world is. All right, so the eye of flesh. Stuff you can touch. Eye of mind, the Pythagorean theorem. Show me the Pythagorean theorem in the world. Doesn't exist. It's in your head, but you use it to measure, right? So science, empirical science, replicable science. So what Ken is saying is there's ways of knowing that follow certain strands of knowing. If you want to know this, do this. How do you prove something is real? Evidence. Do you love your parent? Yeah. Prove it. I could. I mean, like sacrificing something. Well, okay. Well, you're, you're talking about an action, but how do you prove your personal love for a parent? Like. With nothing. Right now in real time. Prove it to me. <laughs> because what Ken would say it's the eye of contemplation it's the emotional world okay. you experience it and you can basically communicate to others that they can experience it and that becomes a community of knowledge that's real okay so the key of science is it's replicable I can teach you how to do it and you can validate it within your own experience Okay, that's science too. If we can repeat it and replicate it. Using the evidence that of from one of three eyes. You know, it's just like, you know, if you've gotten stoned, you know what getting stoned is like. Yeah, we'll we'll continue this anyway, but the idea is if you know what getting stoned is like and you've never been drunk, you can't explain to somebody who's only gotten drunk what being stoned is like. But if you will know other people that have gotten stoned, you've got a shared experience. That's the eye of contemplation. That's a validation. Yeah, I'll move this three eyes thing to include uh, what we'll be looking at. Intro. Lane Online. Learn. Unlearn. Relearn.